those of you who got an invite, welcome to NerdProm. <laughs> no matter where in the world you are, we're all NERDS International. With the hyphen. Nerds International proudly presents... Welcome to the Dragons Are Real podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode. In this episode, I'm going to discuss virtual tabletops. In the past week and a half, I've played four different virtual tabletops, being Runehammer VTT, Tabletop Simulator, Map Tool, and Fantasy Ground. So I'm going to give you my thoughts on, does it make a difference in which virtual tabletop you use in your game? And does it make a difference to the players? So let's get on with it. So the first one I'm going to discuss is Runehammer VTT. I use this for an ICRPG game that I run with some of the guys over on the Audio Dungeon Discord. This was a last minute game uh, put it on. Um, we were supposed to be playing Alter State with Jason, but due to some issues in his personal life, he couldn't run it. So I stepped in and said that I would pull on a game. So I ran my Flash Golden uh, conversion, which uh, I, I did about 18 months ago. I played a couple of times with my face-to-face -face group, so I thought, nice and easy, it's already done, I'll run it for the guys online. And because I didn't have much time to prep for it, I thought, you know what, let's try Runehammer VTT. Now this system is very early stages of development, it's only open to Patreons for hosting games, um, but you can invite anybody you want to, but as long as the, it's the patron running the game. And the way this works is, it's a one screen, you share with your players. You have uh, the first image you import is the background and then anything else you place uh, images you drag onto the screen. It's anything else you drag onto the screen is a token which everybody's got access to. And basically it's browser based. You share the URL with your players and they can all access the same screen and anybody can move the tokens around. And along the bottom, it's got a number of dice from a D4 to D20. You click on those and the dice roll is made. The downside of the Runehammer is it's each um, page you have to re-log in again. So if you change the background image, then as the GM, then you have to send out a new page to the players. Um, this is going to be changed in one of the later versions. But as I say, it's, it's a very early iteration of Runehammer VTT. So to get around this, I had the background image was an overlay or an underlay, which had a timer across the top. I had some target numbers on the left and basically I could drag on my backgrounds onto that as a token and then the player's tokens would be on top. What I did for this game was that I got some nice fantasy uh, art and used that to, for the players. The token size I changed depending on if they were in the foreground or the rear ground. And it's a nice simple system. There's not much for the players to do. All they have to do is drag a token where they want to and roll the dice roll. And it just rolls the basic dice. If they've got any modifiers, then they have to hold that somewhere else, whether it be a scrap of paper at home. And then you do the dice roll and then you just tell the GM, I rolled a six and I got a plus two, so my result is eight. What I like about Runehammer VTT, it's dead simple to set up. All you need is some images and some tokens. You don't have to go into too much effort. Uh, the art I managed to get was really nice art. I had a nice swamp with some uh, tree houses and some buildings in the background so the players could, sort of, could move to the background by shrinking their tokens. And as a GM, it was nice. I could concentrate on running the game and not too much about all the different assets I had. It was just a matter of dragging from File Explorer some tokens on the resizing them and then we just carry on with the game. So that was the first VTT that I used. 
The next one I used, which was the first for me, was Tabletop Simulator. Now, if Runehammer VTT is bare bones, then Tabletop Simulator is at the other end of the spectrum. It's a 3D table, which you, you actually sit around the 3D table, the players sit around the outside. In the middle of the table, you have the terrain and uh, standees and you have dice which you roll 3d dice and you can pick those up and roll them across the table you have your character sheet in front of you on the table uh, any loot cards or anything like that is, is put in front of you and it's just like sitting at a real table it's a completely um, different type of game uh, looks wise and immersion wise you do feel as if you're sitting around a table with your friends and what's nice about it is that you can each have independent views so you can pan and zoom in around the table, spin the table around. You can be looking at one part of the terrain while all the other players are looking somewhere else. Uh, it is possible that you could get lost and be looking at the wrong thing, but I mean, it's easy for the GM to draw your attention to what's going on and to ping. And you've also got some camera saves. So if you need to keep going back to the same location, like, in, like when I was playing, if I want to go back to my camera sheet, it was a matter of pressing shift one and that would zoom the camera back to, to look at my character sheets. If I wanted to travel to my dice, it was shift two. So you can set up these camera positions so you can quickly zoom in and zoom out if you need to go back and pick up your physical dice. Very immersive um, and although it was using the same ICRPG rules, it has a completely different feel to it. I know for the GM, there is a lot of work done behind the scenes because Gary from the Murder Hobbies show that ran the game for me, um, he's got to source the maps. Uh, he, he converts his 2D top down maps into 3D. He puts different layers on them. He finds trees, he finds walls, he finds buildings. Uh, one of the scenes, we had some nice fog uh, and mist across that we could go through. We had the crocodiles coming out of the swamp, sinking in and sinking out. Uh, very immersive, but very time consuming. Uh, but it's almost like being in a, in, a, in a video game. Very immersive. So that was the second one, Tabletop Simulator. The next one I played a couple of days later, uh, earlier to that was my map tool using the 5e, 5th edition D&D. We played Lost Minds of Fandelver. And that is a top-down uh, virtual tabletop where you actually look down on top of the map uh, above the players' heads. The tokens I've got are top-down tokens um, by Devlin Knight. Uh, cracking tokens they are. Uh, the other thing that uh, Map Tool allows me to do is I've got all macro set up for all the dice rolling. So whatever weapon the players roll, uh, all the modifiers, the proficiencies, any modifiers are rolled into the button. So all they have to do is press one button. They don't have to refer to the character sheet. All the spells are one click. I did a bit of a screw up with the Fog of War. Um, we did have Fog of War and it's individual Fog of War. And as the players move around, unlike the other two virtual tabletops, we you actually you have a, like an arc around you where you can see. In Runehammer, we're all seeing the same screen, so there's no Fog of War. In Tabletop Simulator, if you want to put up Fog of War, then basically you, jump, you drop a block on top of the... 3D terrain and it hides it and then the, play, the GM removes the whole block to reveal the scene. But with Map Tool I've got it set up so it's dynamic fog of war. Uh, but because I hadn't clicked a, a checkbox, what normally happens is each token has got its own uh, field of view and what it sees around it. Um, but by unchecking this box it meant that once they moved on what had already been revealed was still visible. So as they got further into this castle and they were really into the kosh um, and as GM I played really hard against them. I was throwing hobgoblins and bugbears at them um, and a couple of times it nearly got close to a total party kill and when they sort of sealed the doorway off um, to sort of minimise the, uh, the fighting on them I started sending goblins around the sides around the back but because I hadn't got the fog of war um, um, refreshing they could see that they were all running behind them so it became a bit of a Benny Hill theme then as they're running one way the goblins are running the other way and they're all running around this castle trying to get each other and then we actually had the Benny Hill theme tune so yeah it was uh, again it, it was a very much of a skirmish game that because there was a lot of, of combat in that castle and for a lot of time they were under the cosh the last game that um, I was involved with with another virtual tabletop was using Fantasy Grounds. 
Now that was Worldwide Wrestling. It's a Powered by the Apocalypse game. And we're playing the Western State Championship Wrestling on TV8. And for that, um, Uncle Jay from the Murder Hobo Show had set up the game. And he'd used Fantasy Grounds to, so we had all the Powered by the Apocalypse moves. All the modifiers were on the character sheet. So you could click those and it rolled 3D dice on the screen. Um, so it's nice and easy to roll. But for visuals, we just had a wrestling ring with a couple of tokens. And to be honest, we didn't really use the tokens much because most of the time we were just talking that sort of the moves we were doing, uh, quite narrative. But the Fantasy Grounds really helped. Um, I'd never played the system before, and although I played Power by the Apocalypse, I never played Worldwide Wrestling. So to have a character sheet there with all my different moves on it, and it's just a matter of clicking a button and it does the roll for me. And if I wanted to have a look at what the move meant, then clicking another button would give me everything behind the scenes. So for Worldwide Wrestling, that worked really well. Again, it's a, it's a top-down system. Now, so that's four different systems in about a week and a half. What's it, uh, you might ask, which is the best system to use? And I would say that out of all those four systems, there's not one that I prefer the other. All of them gave a completely different feel. Um, the Rune Hammer one with the art was a very evocative for the players and for the GM. It gave you a feel as if you were there. The 3D one, uh, on tabletop submit again, you were moving through trees, so it was like you were there. The top-down skirmish one, it was fast and, and brutal uh, sort of uh, battle we had. Um, fast moving, but it was quite immersive. And same with the wrestling of Although um, there was no um, visuals, the talking that we were doing was really sort of uh, put you in the, in, in the spirit of it. Um, and the other thing with the wrestling game was, although there was only two of you actually doing the wrestling match at any one time, the other two players were doing the commentating. So it really felt as if you were in the wrestling ring. So my take, we were discussing it after the game about all these different virtual tabletops that are out there. And we all came to the same conclusion that they all do different things in different ways and there's no there's no one that's better than the other they, they do slightly different things but what's going to end up uh, happening is that you're all going to have all these different virtual tabletops you're going to have to install in your machine because as a gm you find you invest in a system and you find out how it works for me it's map tool i spend a lot of time learning how to code the macros learning shortcuts learning bits of code getting the right images, um, running everything. And it's the same with the others. Um, Jay has spent a lot of t invested a lot of time in Fantasy Grounds. Gary's invested a lot of time in Tabletop Simulator. The new one you don't have to invest time in is Runehammer VTT. So my thoughts on it are, it doesn't matter what the uh, tabletop is, because all that is doing is aiding the running of the game. Any one of, the, any of, one of those four games could be run in any of four of those virtual tabletops. Yes, the feel would be slightly different, but I don't think it would have any outcome on the game. It's all down to the, it adds to the immersiveness. And in some cases, it uh, reduces the load on the players if the, uh, for the dice rolls and for referencing. But in my mind, it's use whatever that you enjoy as a GM because the players will adapt to it. And the, at, uh, the two of those tabletops I'd never used before uh, and within a very short space of time I knew what I was doing. There'll be the odd occasion where I was, oh how do I do that again? But I said, you know that the other players or the other GMs know how to use it. So my final thoughts are pick one that you like the look of and spend your time learning that one. As a GM invest the time in it because if you invest the time in it then your players will get the reward. So that's my thoughts on virtual tabletops. So I'd like to give a shout out to the Finding the Narrative podcast. Finding the Narrative is a Genesis RPG podcast found on the Nerds International Network. And they've just released episode 59. If you don't know what 
Genesis is. It's a narrative role-playing system by Fantasy Flight Games. It's got some f uh, fancy dice which are unique to the game and basically you roll the dice in and interpret them and the players and GM work out the narrative due to the results of the dice. And in the latest episode Stephen Dragonspawn has done a conversion for the old Fantasy Flight Dragon Star game. So Dragon Star is a science fantasy setting where you've got orcs and drow and the likes all your fantasy races and it's set in space so it's an actual play so if you're into actual plays and you want a bit of science fantasy then check out episode 59 of finding the native podcast that's all for this episode thanks for listening and i'll catch you all on the flip side You've been listening to the Dragons Are Real podcast. For more information, check out our website at petejones.neocities.org, our blog at dragonsarealpodcast.tumblr.com, and we're also on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.